Uh, but he says, I'm um, sorry, I left off my quote there. Um, when kainos is rendered new, as in many English translations that you can pick up, then the implication seems to be that Judaism, and this is the translation that you're going to, this is the interpretation that you're going to find in most Christian commentaries. Judaism cannot possibly be a suitable framework for honoring Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. Only the new wineskin of Gentilized Christianity will work. And so it's no wonder that many forms of Gentile Christianity that exist today don't have any real appreciation for the Jewish worldview, which it includes, which includes with it the people of Israel uh, having a primary place at God's table, the law of Moses having a relevancy in people's lives, the Tanakh uh, having a place of preeminence when it comes to Bible study and things like that. So it's no wonder that many Christians are proud of saying, we're New Testament Christians. And by that, they don't just mean that they've been redeemed by Jesus and that they've been set free, and that's what they mean by New Covenant experience. They typically also, whether they imply it or not, whether they know it or not, they typically are also including with that description of New Testament Christian, they're typically including with that the baggage of replacement theology that we don't keep the law of Moses anymore. As a Gentile Christian church, we don't have to. Jesus brought the new. We don't need the old. Jesus is the type. We don't look to the shadows anymore. I've been recently having a dialogue with someone who's um, um, been watching my YouTube videos and leaving comments. And his point that he's trying to make is that Jesus brought the reality. So why do we need the shadows anymore? Like, like, like Paul's um, discussion and words in Colossians about um, uh, shadows and things like that, right? Jesus is the body. Why do we look to the shadows, which is the Old Testament? Why, why do we need that? As if the, the shadow is a pejorative or a negative or a bad thing to bring into our life. But um, most Christians are going to say, uh, well, I'm a New Testament Christian, therefore I don't need Judaism anymore. anymore. This is a peculiar conclusion, David Stern continues, especially if we recalled that Yeshua was speaking with his fellow Jews, right? And he goes on to say that is rendered here in the uh, the point is that the only vessel which can hold the new wine of messianic life, right, Yeshua's teaching, in a Jewish setting is a properly renewed, restored, reconditioned, sorry, let me scroll up there, start over, uh, a, a messianic life as a Jewish setting is a properly renewed, restored, reconditioned, and refreshed Judaism, such as messianic Judaism was in the first century and it aims to be now. And so he's going to champion, he's going to push his case that Messianic Judaism is viable. It was viable then. It's viable now, right? Um, let's keep reading David Stern's commentary. Taken together, this is the conclusion he comes to, verse 16 and 17, talking about Matthew, imply that both Messianic faith and Judaism should adjust to each other, right? Remember, in one, uh, in uh, when he says adjust to each other, what he means is he's reminding us that in the parable of the cloth, Right, we have a new patch and an old cloth, and we recondition the patch before introducing it to the cloth, to the old clothing, to the garment. So, in the first parable, the first part, the patch, the right, the new piece, the one that's for coming from the outside of the uh, story, uh, is the part that needs to recondition itself. We need to wash the patch first before we sew it to the old garment. But in the uh, parable of the wineskins, and we're introducing new wine to old wineskins, new to old. It's not the new that needs to recondition itself. It's the old that needs to make the adjustment. Are you carefully catching the details here? So if we just read the story and look at just the details, even at a face value level, um, uh, there are some slightly different details. And that's what David Stern's trying to say is if we put the two and overlap them, the um, part of the the part of the story about the patch and the part of the story about the wine. If we overlap those two, then we come to the conclusion that both parts need to adjust to each other. So there's some adjustment going on between two. He says, however, the accommodating must be true to God's word. On that, there is no room. On that, there's no room for compromise. And he he suggests that you see uh, 1352 of his commentary and following. And I, if I were to click on that footnote number nine there, I lifted that from his uh, Jewish New Testament commentary, which I don't need to do. Let's uh, see. Um, I didn't get much further uh, 
than uh, I did uh, last week. I mean, I read one little paragraph, and I don't really jump want to jump uh, into. Um, do I want to? Let me see. Let's read this part here. I'm going to read it without stopping, and this will kind of give us a uh, wetter appetite for next week. Um, I say in my commentary, these are my own thoughts, right? Do you see how much better David Stern's version or his view is his interpretation? It fits with the overall historic message of both Tanakh and Apostolic scriptures than do the views of the previously examined mainline Christian positions on these verses. Of course, we're comparing the um, kind of representative replacement theology view where the old is Judaism and the new is Christianity and the old is out and the new is in. With David Stern's interpretation of no, we don't need to throw out the old called Judaism. We simply just need to work with the existing elements and allow God's word to make the changes where applicable, or um, you know the um, the stretching uh, and things like that where it's where it's needed. I continue. Yeshua's words were not said in a vacuum, and I remind this to people reading my commentary. Uh, in modern times here, because oftentimes we, we were so quick to jump from the first century worldview where everything was really um, Jewish centric. And we want to jump all the way 2000 years into the future to our own worldview and our own church settings, which have been Gentilized, where we don't have an appreciation for Judaism, the Tanakh, the Torah, the law of Moses, Judy, Israel as a people, et cetera, et cetera. We want to make this um, anachronistic leap uh, and apply that to Yeshua's words. But Yeshua's words weren't said in a vacuum. What do I say? They were presented to a group of first century Jewish people following a Torah that was given to the nation of Israel over a thousand years earlier. What, what does this mean? It implies that this means if one leaps past the context of the first century, like many Christian commentaries do, I know they're well meaning, but they're not really playing by the best hermeneutic practices when it comes to interpreting the Bible from the historical grammatical method. So if you practice this form of interpretation that I'm calling in, uh, uh, replacement theology where the old is out, the new is in, then you're not going to end up with the best interpretation that um, fits really what Yeshua was trying to um, teach. So it means, I say, uh, if one leaps past the context of the first century and immediately begins to inadvertently apply Yeshua's parable to 21st century false religions, then one will necessarily miss the main point of the master's words in favor of one's own pretext, right? Well, what do we always say? Um, words without context are only pretext. And that's the danger when you're, replace, when you're um, replacing the context of the passages with your own um, personal opinion.